जिंदा है तो जिंदगी ये जीत में यकीन कर अगर कहीं है स्वर्ग तो उतार ला जमीन पर तो जिंदा है तो जिंदगी ये जीत में यकीन कर अगर कहीं है स्वर्ग तो उतार ला जमीन पर तो जिंदा है Women being raped and children being killed, and how insensitive our society has become. People are not wrong. What is wrong is their religion. What is wrong is their social ideology. Now the point is, do we want to sustain institutions in which equality and liberty cannot be sustained? एक समय था जब गरीबी से लड़ने की जरूरत थी. अब वो समय आया है जब संप्रदायिकता से लड़ने की जरूरत है. Struggle against communism can be properly waged by young people like you. If you constantly interact with your with people who are around you, people are having so much of myths regarding Muslim community. हमारे खेलों तक पे ऐसा ही देखने को मिलता है। अपने निजी स्वार्थों के लिए, निजी लाभ के लिए, वो पूरे शहर का, पूरे समाज का माहौल बिल्कुल खराब कर देता है। I refuse to believe that the majority of our media is spreading hate or prejudice. आपस में इस तरह की चीजें चलती रहे, समाज बटा रहे, उनको रोटियां सिकने का जो मौका मिलता रहे। Generally the people who perpetuate these crimes, they get away without getting any punishment. Suppose such a carnage breaks out around you, what are you going to do? Don't forget Afghanistan, don't forget Taliban, don't forget that these are the consequences of great internal strife produced by the same factors at work in our part of the world. Don't forget that. Fascism in India will not come in the form in which it has come in Europe. Fascism in India will come in the form of communism. Even if not in the short run, I'm quite optimistic in the long run it will be defeated. It has to be defeated because it cannot survive. Because history has not been shaped like this. And history will come to the rescue of the future of a great nation like India. What is it that this one word conveys to you and me? How is it that uh, this small little sleepy town in North India has suddenly got flashed? What is it that has brought about this particular transformation? in the context of Ayodhya. Where does one begin the narrative thereof? I should like to pose a straightforward question to start with. Do we take Ayodhya as a physical site? just a small town or does it mean something more than that to us for me Ayodhya is not merely a physical site for me it represents an ideological site for me Ayodhya has become a symbol a symbol 
of India's existence, a symbol of the existence of Indians. Who the Indians are, what do the Indians stand for, what is India, what is India stands for. For me, Ayodhya has become a symbol of these questions. Well, perhaps in common parlance, uh, it would be stating the obvious that Ayodhya is the city of Rama's birth. Is that the only reality of Ayodhya? How does we try to comprehend what Ayodhya stands for? Even if it is supposedly the Nagari of Ram, when does that become so? Well, I won't be surprised if um, some of you carry the impression that uh, Ram Katha, Ram Charitmanas, Ramayan begins from Goswami Tulsi Das, thanks to the electronic media. I'm referring to the serialization of Ramayan in the 80s by Ramanan Sagar, who gave the title Ramayan to his serial, which I thought was a great misnomer. Tulsidas wrote Ram Charit Manas. Valmiki is credited with the writing of Ramayan. Even if you know Valmiki as the author of Ramayan, you should also know that he was not the first to write about it, to write about the narrative of Ram. We are familiar with the expression Ram Katha. Evidently, when uh, a genius like Valmiki picks up a theme, it must have been done with the clear understanding that he is picking up a theme which is already in the air. Yes, Ram Katha was in the air well before. Valmiki decided to write this great epic and a great poetry. Surely Valmiki is not the initiator of the tradition of Ramkatha. There are versions which are older than Valmiki's version. Ramkatha, which seem to have existed prior to Valmiki's Ramayan, sometimes link up Ram, not with Ayodhya, but with Varanasi. How does this geographical shift take place within Ram Katha, from Varanasi to Ayodhya? There are people who have gone to the extent of arguing with quite some cogent reasoning that Valmiki's Ayodhya might well have been in Afghanistan, modern day Afghanistan. I'm not entering into that debate. When we really talk about Ayodhya, what kind of images can we really invoke? Apart from this being the place of the birth of Lord Rama. Fahyan in the late 4th and early 5th century, and Xuanzang, another Chinese pilgrim, who comes in the first half of the 7th century. And both of them are very eloquent about Ayodhya being a center dominated by the Buddhists. Ayodhya was an important Buddhist establishment ought to be recognized. Not that other people did not live there. It's quite obvious that they did. But that there were multiple identities operating in the city is a point that ought not to be overlooked. When I think of Ayodhya, I also <coughs> think of the Brahmakund Gurdwara, which is supposed to be, have been visited by Guru Nanak. When I think of Ayodhya, my thoughts also go back to Ashwakulla, who belonged to this particular place, who was sentenced to death by the British for having been involved in the Kakori case. We all know about that. When I think of Ayodhya, I also think about great socialist 
आचार्य नरेंद्र देव देर इज अ रेलवे स्टेशन नेम्ड आफ्टर आचार्य नरेंद्र देव इन फैजाबाद वेन आई थिंक ऑफ अयोध्या माई थॉट्स ऑल्सो गो टू बेगम मख्तरी बाई द ग्रेट म्यूजिशन दीज आर सेवरल इमेजेस दैट कम टू आर माइंड वेन वी टॉक अबाउट अयोध्या वील हैव टू टेक द नेरेटिव वे बैक इन टू द नाइनटीन सेंचुरी माइन वुड बी अ परस्पेक्टिव विच इज लास्टली फोकस्ड ऑन हिस्टोरिकल एंड आर्कियोलॉजिकल एविडेंसिस let me make one observation in this context that those who are making out a case of faith on the question of ayodhya must realize that faith must also have some reason to stand on i strongly feel about that and surely they realize it otherwise they would not have been collecting all sorts of evidences from here and there from literature from history from archaeology and so on and so forth they have also been doing that so evidently they know that if they have to sustain their faith they must reason out their case when we talk about archaeology of ayodhya our thoughts go back to sir alexander cunningham who founded the great institution archaeological survey of india way back in 1861 the same institution which was given the responsibility by the allahabad high court in 2003 cunningham back in the 19th century explored an area called kubair tila i would uh, like you to keep in mind the specific spots which acquire specific names in local traditions and they should be seen as not being without significance kubair tila it's quite significant that important archaeological spots in ayodhya have names which have very little to do with ram or ram katha we must bear that in mind so cunningham in kubair tila found a buddhist stupa that was late 19th century in the 1950s professor b b lal undertook certain explorations explorations of sites which he thought might corroborate india's literary tradition so in the period between 50 and 52 he had excavated hastinapur so these several sites were dug up in ayodhya and the team of bhu confirmed that the settlement at ayodhya did not go beyond 6th century bc important point that was highlighted in these excavations was that there was no specific religious structure which could be identified at that place then came the decade of the 70s between 75 and early 80s professor bb lal in 1975 started a long drawn project called archaeology of ramayan sites Ayodhya of course was his major focus there were several sites within Ayodhya dug up by Bibi Lal in the 70s and these sites included <coughs> Nandi Gram Chitrakoot Nal Tila Sita Ki Rasoi Ram Janm Bhoomi etc etc between 75 and 78 three seasons he dug up at Ayodhya Ayodhya report was never published it has in been published to this day it's almost 25 years now report has not been published very significant indeed the chronology that he built was that ayodhya was first settled in about 7th century bc 
increasing the antiquity of the site by just about 100 odd years as compared to 1969 diggings. Not just that. Professor Lal also underlined that when he gave this chronology, there was big ruckus created by the local pandas. And he talks about Danda Munda Sammelan, that the pandas were after him and they unleashed their violence, verbal and physical, against him. Hopefully some of you might know that Ram, according to Indian literary tradition and chronology, is ascribed to the Treta Yuga. And Krishna, the hero of Mahabharata, is supposed to be of Dwapar Yuga. Dwapar comes after Treta. And after Dwapar comes the age in which we are living. We have been condemned, so we are told, by the Puranas to live in the Kali Yuga. Ram in the Treta, Krishna in the Dwapar. Dwapar comes after Treta. But Hastinapur of the Mahabharata was older than Ayodhya of Ramayana. Isn't that a contradiction? No wonder Bibi Lal became target of attack by the obscurantist elements in Ayodhya itself, which he identifies as the Dand Mund Sammelan. Suddenly, in 1990, Bibi Lal publishes an article in an RSS magazine called Manthan. Not in any official publication of the Archaeological Survey of India, but in a magazine of RSS, 1990. Fifteen years after he had done his excavations at Ayodhya, professional historians and archaeologists took up the matter and took up the matter with the government of India as well and pleaded that if indeed there has been such a finding, which B. B. Lal claims, then surely it should be verifiable from the records. Government yielded and allowed some historians to inspect the material. Regrettably, the most crucial evidence was still not shown. The specific trenches from where Lal claimed to have discovered these pillar bases. All records pertaining to those specific trenches were not shown. An argument was that site notebooks have been lost. So much for the responsible behavior of the Archaeological Survey of India, that great institution founded by Sir Alexander Cunningham. Site notebooks, it was claimed, were lost. Was Bibi Lal fabricating evidence? You know, Indian constitution was adopted on the 26th of January, 1950. Not many, perhaps, may know that just about a month before that, a big fraud had already been committed on Indian Republic. I'm talking about the surreptitious manner in which Ram Idol was installed in the Babri Masjid on the night of December 22nd, 23, 1949. Both the Home Minister and the then Prime Minister, Sadar Patel and Pandit Nehru respectively, had seen the consequences of that and had warned the then Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Govind Vallabh Pant, about it. The dispute was taken to the courts and it resulted in the locking of the whole premises. So from 49 to the 80s, the enclosure remained locked. And once the locks were removed, the whole city almost got besieged, besieged by powers such as the Vishwa Hindu Parishad and the Bajrang Dal, besieged to the extent that it wasn't very easy for many people with different faiths to be 
free movers in the city. Between 90 and 92, these forces undertook what they called leveling operation, ground leveling operation. And they claimed that they had discovered certain stone pieces. Here these people started talking about unearthing great architectural stone members and claimed that these are pieces of the temple. Even then, Archaeological Survey of India remained a mute spectator, did not intervene while bulldozers were being used. Imagine archaeology being done through bulldozers by car works, not by trained archaeologists. Professional historians had indeed exposed these findings. 1992, 6th December, we all know what happened. The dastardly act took place. Babri Masjid was vandalized, destroyed, unparalleled. Archaeological Survey of India still remained a mute spectator. Was it a demolition of a mosque? Is it a question of temple versus mosque? I had raised the question earlier on and formulated my idea. Why do I regard Ayodhya not as a physical site? Why do I regard Ayodhya as an ideological site? For me, it's not a question of temple versus mosque. For me, it's not even the question of Hindus versus the Muslims. India's identity is at stake. We ought to be concerned about it. India's identity, which comprises of its very rich, pluralistic, cultural heritage. People like Amir Khusro also hailed from there, way back in the 13th, 14th century. This is the area which was headquarter of a province of the Turks in the 13th, 14th century. Nasiruddin Chirag, the disciple of Nizamuddin Aulia, also hailed from Ayodhya. That's the legacy of Ayodhya. And that's the legacy of India. India stands for that identity, the pluralistic cultural identity, immortalized in poem of Ravindnath Tagore, which is eloquently called Bharata Tirth. He calls it Bharata Tirth. And that identity is that India is a land where several streams have come. The Aryans have come here, the Hunas have come here, the Shakas have come here, the Kushanas, the Pathans, the Mughals. So many people have come and they've all become part of this land. They have merged their own identity, if there was any, into that of this land. Just as river loses its identity after flowing into the sea, into the big oceans, similar has been the identity of India, where several streams have gotten meshed and created an India that we have known through the millennia. An idea that uh, Tagore described in these words I think has been summed up by Firak Gorakhpuri in just two lines, beautifully summed up. Sar zameen-e hind par awam-e alam ke firak kafile baste gaye hindustan banta gaya. It is this identity which is at stake. इन काली सदियों के सर से जब रात का आंचल ढलकेगा जब दुख के बादल पिघलेंगे जब सुख 
Oh, I give you my love. 